Today we are finding roots of perfect squares or square roots and tomorrow we'll focus on cube roots. Um, both square roots and cube roots have something called a radical. I'm going to read down here, much of mathematics involves learning how to do something and then learning how to undo it. When two operations undo each other, we call them inverse operations. You might remember addition and subtraction are inverses, multiplication and division are inverses. A radical is one of the tools used to undo an exponent. There are three parts to a radical expression, the radical sign, the radicand, and the index. So this little n will usually be a number and it'll be little and it's called the index. It indicates what type of root this is. Then the little, um, my students call it like a check mark, that is the radical or the radical sign. And then the thing inside the radical is called the radicand. And if you ever remember learning that the number inside the division symbol is a dividend, this is a radicand. A lot of the time we talk about it with an and or an end at the end. Okay, so the index indicates which exponent it undoes. So if there's a two, it undoes the exponent of a two. If there's a three, it undoes the exponent of a three. If there is no index, so no number is written, then we assume the index is a two. So it is a square root. You don't ever have to write a two on your square roots. Just like absolute value bars ask a question about the number inside, it says what's this number's distance from zero? The square root symbol is asking a question about the number underneath the radical symbol. The question it is asking is what number squared or what number times itself gives us this number. So for example one, the square root of nine, well what number times itself equals nine? Three, because three times three equals nine. Now you, you probably see why I asked you to memorize the perfect squares because it makes this a lot easier. Square root of 25, what times itself equals 25? It's five. And square root of 81, well, why don't you just try b through e real quick? I get nine, one, 16, and 12. Um, just a note that taking the square root changes a group of two factors inside the radical into one factor outside the radical, and that will come in handy in the future. Okay, a couple things. You can't take the square root of a negative number. Why? Because when you multiply a positive times a positive, the answer will be positive, and a negative times itself the answer will also be positive. So there's not really a way to get a negative number, at least not that we know of. Fractions may not be your type of favorite type of number, but it turns out that radicals play well with fractions. Um, I like to say that radicals distribute over multiplication or division, just like how multiplication distributes over addition. So we can say that the square root of a number over another number is equal to the square root of a over the square root of b. We can do them in either order, whichever is easier. So when you look at these, I don't like 25 49ths. I don't know the square root of it, but I know the square root of 25 and I know the square root of 49. So this equals 5 sevenths. Why don't you go ahead and try just taking the square root of the top and the bottom to find the fractions for b through d. You should have gotten 9 thirteenths, 15 fourths, and 1 tenth. Isn't that easy? So as you can tell, it'll be really nice to know the perfect squares. I would recommend knowing actually up through 144, but you might wanna write down for yourself what do each of these equal? Square root of one, square root of four, square root of nine, etc. Okay, that's basically all you should know for today. Good luck.